So, Jen, do I have a case for you? Ooh, goody. What's it about? Well, it's about a little boy named Bobby Greenleaf. Ooh, I know him. My grandma used to talk about this case all the time. If you're from the Midwest, you might be a little bit familiar with this. Upon doing some research, I learned quite a few things. So, I think you might be surprised as well. Cool. I came across this because I went to the Missouri State Penitentiary, did a little tour. The one in Jeff City, right? The one in Jeff City. Did Mm -hmm. the haunted tour. I didn't see a ghost, of course. My kid touched my leg in the dark, and I was all excited. I thought a ghost was trying to make contact, but it was just my kid. So, Like, what kind of contact did you think touching your leg well, it was on the back you? of my lower, like, by my ankle. Okay. Oh, okay. He was going to, the ghost was going to pull me down. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. So I want to talk about little Bobby Greenlace. You ready? Yep, let's go. So I'm going to tell you a story about a time in our nation when things were way different than they are today. You know, there was no internet back then, no gaming devices, no round-the-clock news channels or getting whatever you want simply by the touch of a button. It was a much simpler time where people trusted each other. Mm -hmm. Everyone left their doors unlocked, windows wide open. You know, kids could play outside unsupervised all day and come home when the street lights kicked on. That's kind of how we grew up, right? That's exactly how we grew up. But that all changed one September day in 1953 when people in the Midwest lost their innocence and witnessed what true evil is. Dun, dun, dun. All right, Jen, here we go. All right, where did this happen at? I'm glad you asked. Kansas City, Missouri, 1953. So on September 28th at around 10.53 a.m., little Bobby Greenlease, a six-year-old cutie pie, is in uh, his classroom at Notre Dame Deshaun School when a nun entered the classroom asking if Bobby could come with her. Apparently, a woman claiming to be his aunt had just arrived at the school and said that she needed to pick up Bobby because his mother had suffered a heart attack Mm -hmm. and she needed to rush him to his parents. Now, Bobby asked the nun if he could take his Jerusalem medal, and this is an award he won for his uh, stellar academics, and of course, the nun said yes, and that comes into play later. The young nun named Sister Moran... Now, she was French, right? She was French, and she was pretty new to the country and also to the school. It was kind of an exchange program? Was that it? Or I don't know about that. I just know that, you know, I think nuns travel sort of like mission mission trips. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the young nun allowed Bobby to leave with the woman and said that the boy took the hand of the lady and they left the building jumping into a waiting taxi cab as if he knew her. But the thing is, she was not his aunt. She wasn't. Nope. His mother was just fine. Instead, this woman, who we later learn is named Bonnie Hetty, had just walked into a primary school and kidnapped the son of a very wealthy man. Jen, you know the saying, the stars were aligned, referring to a situation where everything just kind of goes in your favor, goes your way. I do know the saying. Anyway, on this day that this lady arrived to get Bobby, the mother superior was out on school business, and the principal happened to be teaching a class. So the young nun, being pressured by Hetty to hurry up, simply let the young child go with her. No questions asked. No questions asked. Because, you know, back then, there weren't cyanide sheets or or needing to show ID that we have to do today. Right. So just like that, little cute Bobby Greenlees hopped into a car with a strange lady and off they went. Sister Moran now later recalled uh, to authorities that Bobby didn't seem to hesitate going with the lady and that, in fact, she had her arm around him and was holding his hand. As a good, obedient boy. boy, As back in those times, it was very, um, you respected your elders. Yep. You didn't question. Yep. You know, we we are so jaded today by the news of things like this because we get it 24 hours a day. Well, and remember, Stranger Danger came into the late 80s, 90s, 90s, early 90s, something like that. Stranger danger Mm -hmm. this obviously did make big news but it took a while because like i said there weren't tv channels or anything like that but bobby greenlee's father robert greenlee senior just happened to be one of the richest men in the midwest right so bobby greenlee's was the son of robert cosgrove greenlee's he's a multimillionaire who made his fortune in cars mr greenlee's helped to introduce general motors to the midwest and owned dealerships from south dakota all the way to texas his fortune get this this is a good one his fortune was estimated to be about twenty-four million in nineteen fifty-three. How much does that calculate today? Or did you figure that out already, or did of you? Of course, have to I do did. Math? It's math, but I used the computer. Woo-hoo. It calculates to over two hundred and twenty million. That's petty cash, right? Yeah, petty cash, yeah. right? Itty bitty. Greenlee Senior was the, an older father, having had Bobby at sixty-five years old. Bobby was his only biological son. His mother, Virginia P. Greenlee, was twenty-seven years younger than her husband. Now, both parents obviously doted on little Bobby. Of course, they did. And he was really cute. Yeah, he was adorable. So, Bobby, this is interesting, had one biological sister and an adopted brother named Paul. Now, Paul, who was from a previous marriage, had started to get in a little bit of trouble when he was younger, and Mr. Greenlee decided the best way to straighten him out. Military. 
the threat I still use today with my kids. That's <laughs> military right. Military school. Military school. Paul went to Kemper Military Academy located in Boonville, Missouri, mm-hmm. and it seemed to do him some good. Only later will we realize how fateful his education there would become in little Bobby's disappearance. Hmm. Yeah, Foreshadowing. So at around 1130 that same day, Sister Martiana from the school called the Greenleys household to check on Mrs. Greenleys' condition. Now, imagine her surprise when Mrs. Greenlees, who was supposed to be in the hospital with a heart attack, answered the phone. Didn't you get that? That's supposed to be the scary part. (laughs) Mrs. Greenlees answered the phone, so now the nun's going to know something's up. You think? Yes. Mrs. Greenlees immediately wanted to know, where's Bobby? The nun went on to tell her that a strange lady had shown up at the school saying she was Bobby's aunt, saying that Mrs. Greenlees had a heart attack, and she needed to rush Bobby to Mrs. Greenlees' side. Mrs. Greenlees about fell over and fainted, but before doing so, in a hysterical haze, she called her husband, Robert, who rushed home and immediately contacted the Kansas City chief of police, who in turn reported the kidnapping to the FBI. At this point, you're probably wondering why is the FBI getting involved so quickly. You see, this case seemed to mirror another very famous kidnapping case in America. Any idea, Jen? It's probably the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. It is. It is the Lindbergh kidnapping. And that case changed the law as we know it. So famous aviator Charles Lindbergh's 20-month-old son had been kidnapped at about 9 p.m. on March 1, 1932, from his nursery on the second floor of the Lindbergh home near Hopewell, New Jersey. Now, this was a huge case at the time. Obviously, you might have been alive because you're older than me. Yeah. <laughs> this was a huge case. And Lindbergh, as we know, was famous for crossing the Atlantic, and he had become America's sweetheart. So when this tragic kidnapping of his son happened, I mean, it left all of America heartbroken. It I was- still say his sister-in-law did it. I think it was an accident. Oh, really? They covered it up. Yep. Um, it, it, it is a little strange that the the guy they caught, and he was not actually, well, look it up. You got to look it up. So after the highly publicized kidnapping of the baby, Congress passed the Federal Kidnapping Act, also called the Lindbergh Law or Little Lindbergh Law. The Federal Kidnapping Act was created to allow federal authorities to step in and pursue kidnappers once they have crossed state lines with their victim. Now, the reason with this is that uh, it allows federal authorities, such as the FBI, to be better equipped to pursue the kidnappers across state lines rather than just state or local authorities who cannot do that. Now, originally, kidnapping was not a capital offense. Did you know that? I did know that. I did not. Mm -hmm. See, times have changed. The law was later amended to give juries the discretion to recommend the death penalty in particularly heinous crimes. Huh. Hmm. That'll be interesting later, wink, wink. Foreshadowing. Police soon tracked down the man who was driving the taxi. Mr. Willard Pearson Creech, a woman, entered his cab and requested him to drive her to the school of Notre Dame Deshaun. Now, here's where I'd like to interject that um, if you're going to go kidnap somebody, you know, and you come up with this plan and then you have to rent a taxi to do it. It's, I think you need to re- rework your plan. You mean hire a taxi? Yeah, what did I say? Rent? Rent. Well, you're renting it too, I guess. Well, back then, it was common. Not everybody had cars. I know, but I'm just, come on now. I'm going to rent a taxi and kidnap a child today. Anyhow. Or hire a taxi. There you go. Yeah. Or rent one. Upon arriving at the school, the lady, who we later find out to be Bonnie Hetty, had told him to wait for her because she had desired to be driven to the Katz Drugstore at Westport and Main Streets in Kansas City. In approximately six minutes, the woman re-entered the cab, accompanied by a small boy fitting the description of Bobby Greenlees. When Cretch last saw them, they had stopped behind a blue 1952 or 1953 Ford sedan bearing Kansas license plates. Okay, so it's here that Bonnie Hetty meets up with her accomplice, Carl Austin Hall. And he was waiting in the car with Bonnie's pet boxer. And these two, well, they make quite the pair. A match made in hell, you might say? Very good, a match made in hell. Thank you. So Carl Austin Hall was the son of a wealthy St. Louis lawyer, and the lawyer had died. His dad had died in 1946. Now, he left Hall more than $200,000. Now, again, that's, I mean, that's quite a substantial amount today. So back then, that's pretty good. But, of course, 
the story wouldn't be here if something didn't happen to that. So the money didn't last long with his, he had a very bad drug and drinking problem. Okay. Right. That's usually the story, isn't it? Yep. He started robbing taxi cabs. Oh, good. Right. There's lots of money. Yeah. Thank you. So he wasn't very good at it. (laughs) Even better. Yeah. Right. And he was given a five year term in the Missouri state prison. That's just where I went. Ooh. Mm -hmm. See where this is going? So Hall served 16 months and was released on April 24th, 1953. When Hall was out of prison, he soon met up with a 41-year-old overweight widow. She was Bonnie Brown Hetty, a former gun mole, as well as a prostitute. Bonnie Hetty, almost seven years older than Hall, was addicted to criminal types like Carl Austin Hall was addicted to heroin. Ooh. Well, and you know... She's got all that low self-esteem thing going for her, Very too. much She's so. a widow, overweight. Yeah. And wait wait till you hear, uh, well, we'll, we'll find right. out a little bit more about that low self-esteem plays into this. Of course it does. So Bonnie Hetty was pretty financially secure, but she was devastated by a what? Abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. In 1949, she inherited money, $44,000 approximately, and property, a 360-acre farm near St. Joseph, Missouri, from her father. Now, in 1952, she divorced her husband of 20 years. The court documents said it was due to his infidelity, but the real cause was said to have been his brutality. For example, he ordered her to have 11 illegal abortions because he did not want children. By May 1953, she was an alcoholic who drank a fifth of whiskey each day. I really don't blame her. That's that's horrible. It is horrible. I couldn't imagine and that. Can you, these two, I mean, these two are going to hook up here pretty soon. Like, could it get any worse? Writing's on the wall, people. Hall either drank himself into stupors with her or mainlined heroin. Oh, good. See? Yeah. It's a, it's a healthy relationship. Mm-hmm. So the two obviously went through money fast, and soon they needed more money. And Hall had a plan, a plan he had been working on in prison. And I bet you it's not getting a job and with hard work that they become I'm, wealthy. Yeah, that hard work's going to get in his uh, drinking, his job of drinking mm-hmm. and mainlining heroin. So, yeah, that's not going to happen. So Hall had been concocting a plan to kidnap a child from a wealthy family, and he knew just who it would be. Well, it went so well for the Lindbergh baby. It did. The whole kidnapping plot. Yeah. Yes, it Mm -hmm. did. Hall attended, you ready? Mm -hmm. Kemper Military Academy with a boy. Named Paul Greenlees. Named Paul Greenlees. And he Mm -hmm. knew all about the Greenlees family, how rich they were, and about Paul's little brother, Bobby. And so it all began. I guess military school didn't uh, straighten out. Well, you know, they always say prison doesn't, doesn't make you better it only makes you a better criminal right so i guess maybe that. well i guess military school works for some but not for others then yeah. correct yeah a few hours after the kidnapping the green lease received the first ransom letter concerning the return of their son the first letter mailed special delivery and postmark 6 p.m on september 28 1953 stated now before i read this i'm going to read it incorrectly <laughs> grammatically and phonetically because so pretty much how you're talking yes, now exactly yeah. okay pretty much just like real life i'm gonna beat you up jen your boy been kidnapped get six hundred thousand in 20s tens fed res notes from all 12 districts we realize it takes few days to get that amount boy will be in good hands when you have money ready put ad in kc star we'll meet you in chicago signed mr m do not call police or try to use chemicals on bills or take numbers. Do not to use radio to catch us or boy dies. If you try to trap us, your wife, your other child, and yourself will be killed. You will be watched all the time. You will be told how to contact us with money. When you get this note, let us know by driving up and down Main Street between 39 and 29 for 20 minutes with white rag on car aerial. If do exactly as we say and try no tricks, your boy will be back safe within 24 hours after we check money. Deliver money in army duffel bag. Duffel spelled incorrectly too. Be ready to deliver at once on contact. 400,000 in 20s, 200,000 in tens. Wow. City change bank. (laughs) So second note reads... You ready? It's hard to read this incorrectly. I'm concentrating to not fix it. You must not have got our first letter. Show this to no one. Get 600000 in tens and twenties. Federal Reserve notes from all districts. Spelled wrong. 400000 in twenties. 
200000 in tens, you will not take numbers of trait bills in any way. When you have money, put ad in star personnel, meet me in Chicago, signed M. Call police off and obey instructions. Boy is okay, but homesick. Don't try to stop us or pick up or boy dies. You will hear from us later. Put money in army duffel bag. M. Now here's the sad part. That Jerusalem Cross Award that little Bobby had. Right. That was in the second letter, and mm-hmm. it arrived with that second ransom note. So obviously that convinced the Green Laces and their friends that they... Right, that they were the right ones that they had it. They were obviously not lying. Well, because if it was on the news or anything like that, I'm sure many people were sending fake... Fake things, yeah. Yeah. So the final communication between the um, Greenlees family and the kidnappers was a telephone call received at 1 a.m. on October 5th, 1953. Although the first note assured the Greenlees parents that the child was in good hands, the Greenleases were still unsure, but hope was fading. The FBI, despite inclinations of its agents to hurry up and act, they waited, and the local police also waited, because the Green Leases demanded it. They still believed their son was alive, and they didn't want to upset the kidnappers. That's changed a lot. There's oh, no yeah. Way, right? They tried to do it quickly. Exactly. So, Hall and Hetty delightfully dragged out negotiations for the ransom delivery for several weeks. Hall made more than Unreal. a dozen calls to the Green Leases during this time. Isn't that crazy? I mean, uh, think about two that. Two weeks. Uh-uh. Your no. missing child? So now we get to portray the phone call. One phone call from Hall, who was calling himself M, was with Mrs. Greenlease. It was recorded by federal agents. This is Mrs. Greenlease speaking. We have the money, but we must know that our boy is alive and well. Can you give me that? Can you give me anything that will make me know that? Oh, that's a reasonable request, but to be frank with you, the boy is driving us crazy. We couldn't risk taking him to a phone. Well, I can imagine that. Would you do this? Would you ask him two questions? Give me the answer of two questions. If I had the answer to these two questions, I would know that my boy is alive. All right. Ask him, what is the name of our driver in Europe this past summer? Okay. And the second question, what did you build with your monkey blocks in your playroom the last night you were home? If I can get those answers from you, I'll know you have him and that he is alive, which is the thing you know that I want. We have the boy. He is alive. Believe me, he's driving us nuts. Well, I can imagine that. He's such an active youngster. He's been driving us nuts. C- could you could you get those answers? All right. And scene. Okay, so of course, in, in a later call, Hall stated that the boy would not answer any of the questions when asked. Shocker. Yeah, no. right? Hmm. Didn't see that coming. Too busy driving him nuts. Yeah. So authorities obviously were starting to worry that um, this was not playing out quite like they had expected. This is the part out. You're going to enjoy this. So the delivery of the ransom money was finally arranged by Hall, who instructed go-betweens to leave the 600000 that's $5.5 million in today's world, Ooh, which yeah. weighed 85 pounds in a duffel bag. Here's a little side note. Apparently, he came up with that because he could not lift a duffel bag over 85 pounds, so he wanted it to be right around 85 pounds, which equaled 600000 <laughs> Right? What a guy. What a guy. The duffel bag, he wanted it placed, this is my favorite part, in uh, some high grass near a country lane on October 4th, 1953. But here's the thing. They did it. They placed it out there. But Hall was drunk and couldn't find the money in the field. Of course not. So he had to call again and have them change the drop place to a bridge close to the junction of Highway 40 and 10 East at midnight on October 4th, 1953. Awesome. I mean, come on. He could at least be sober for this. I mean, just a little bit sober. Seriously. Paul called them as M again, the go-betweens, and stated that he had, in fact, picked up the ransom, but the bills had not yet been counted. He also added, quote, you can tell his mother that she will see him as we promised within 24 hours. We will certainly be glad to send him back, end quote. So Hall and Hetty, in their altered state, because, you know, they like to partake in a little booze and a little drug taken. So Hetty was in uh, smack? No, she just, she liked alcohol, okay. fire water. They were both convinced that the police were going to find them. So where did they, gonna, what are they going to do? They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to head for St. Louis mm. with two large metal suitcases, each holding 300000 a apiece. Obviously, they're not too bright, so they go out drinking and partying, and they're spending money like they have it, because they do, and it causes quite the ruckus, and people start kind of paying attention to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in their 
soberness, they decided that they needed to kind of lay low for a while. So they rented a pretty shoddy apartment on Arsenal in South City. Now, we both know where that is, don't we? Right. Mm -hmm. Used to live down there. South, South St. Louis. So, you know, with these two, you know, there's much more fun to come, shall we say. Oh, soon got a little restless one night. And uh, while Hetty was passed out after drinking too much, he left her some money, about $2,000, and hit the road That's with it. the rest. Yep, hit Aww. the road with the rest. Such a sweetheart. Isn't he? He's I a mean, giver. He is a giver. Yes, he is. This is the good part that we like, too. So Hall, after leaving Hetty, um, decides he wants to have a little fun. So he goes and he, you know, hails a cab. And the cab driver just happened to be ex-con John Oliver Hager. Now, Hager works for the Ace Cab Company, which is owned by mobster Joe Costello. Apparently... Back then, if you ever wanted, you know, to hire a prostitute or get some drugs or whatever, your cab drivers in downtown St. Louis could hook you up. And that's exactly what Hall wanted. Hager put him in contact with the prostitute. Now, the three of them kind of got along rather well. So they decided that they were going to party a little bit. Den of thieves. To just uh, party, have a little fun. So the three took a party to a bit more private spot and rented a room at the soon-to-be-famous or infamous Route 66 Landmark Motel named... Coral Courts. The Coral Courts. They were getting their kicks on Route 66. They sure, you know they were. So back then there were a lot of mom and pop hotels, um, you know, with the eight or so units. Right. But the owner of the Coral Courts, John Carr, didn't want that. He wanted something different. He wanted to stand out. So by early 1942, the Coral Court was greeting its first guest. But this wasn't just any old hotel. This had 10 bungalows. And each bungalow was private. And it was decorated in grand style. Honey glazed bricks and large glass block windows mm -hmm. in that classic art deco style but the unique part was is that each unit had two rooms and on each of those sides of the rooms were two garages now why would you need a garage for each hotel room jen well it was a no tell motel the no tell motel and also said gangsters used to hide out there and they would keep their cars hidden exactly gentlemen mm -hmm. or ladies looking for some you know discretion with their rendezvous could park their car in the garage and no one would be the wiser so that was that was quite a different thing back then so there were two garages on either side there was a garage on there was a garage each on size. each side. Yeah. yeah. So like okay. the rooms were, you know, these right. were like stand apart buildings. Right. And so it had, each room had a garage attached to the side. There we go. So the not so bright ex-con cabbie, prostitute, and kidnapper threesome went on a little party and, and binging and lots of drugs and drinking. Now we all know that's going to end well, correct? Mm -hmm. Always does. Paul uh, began to use the cab driver as his personal assistant. He'd send him out on errands, buy clothes, and he's tipping everybody, you know, like there's no tomorrow. He's tipping money to everybody. Right. So that's obviously going to tip you know, off anybody. Well, any ex-con would think, wow, this Zero guy's in really, on that, right? Yeah. Ooh, mm -hmm. he's, he's my new BFF. Hager. The cabbie obviously was taking this all in. And remember, I said, who did he work for? Costello. Right. The big mobster of St. Louis I at the time. It was Joe Costello, right? Joe Costello? Mr. Costello. Yeah, it was Joe Costello. That's Mr. Costello to you. So Hager, the cab driver, was taking this all in and enjoying the new money, but started wondering where it could have all come from. Hmm. Paul, at the suggestion of his new bestie, Hager, rented a townhouse on the outskirts of St. Louis. Why did he do that? Because now Hager knows exactly where he is at all times. Mm. So everything seemed to be going well with the ex-con, the prostitute, and the kidnapper. I mean, geez, what could go wrong? Nothing with those fine folk. No, nothing at all. Until the cabbie, Hager, made a phone call. Who's he going to call? Ghostbusters. Nope, not Ghostbusters. Oh. He is going to call the 11th District St. Louis Police Department. Hmm. So at about 3.30 p.m. on October 6th, 1953, Lieutenant Shoulders and Patrolman Dolan went to investigate. There they found Hall, who was nursing a terrible hangover. Oh, poor baby. Poor thing, as he always is. And the officer searched his bags, and inside they found more than $250,000 and a thirty eight caliber snub-nosed revolver with three cartridges fired. But wait, where's all the other money? I'm glad you caught that crime fighter, Jen. We'll want to find out about that. The hall was taken in for questioning. Now, some hours later, police picked up Hetty, and uh, both were grilled until dawn. I'm sure they had the shakes because they weren't getting any stuff. <laughs> he did. He yeah. did. He then had to call a nurse in to give him a shot of morphine to calm him down because mm. he was shaking so bad. So some hours later, police picked up Hetty. Now, both were grilled until dawn. So do you think these two are going to sing like canaries or what? 
Oh, I definitely would of remember course. impunity. Of course. Mm-hmm. So Hetty at first insisted that she didn't know anything about the kidnapping. Oh, oh. She said that, I love this, she said she thought Hall was a former husband of Mrs. Greenleaf's mm. and that she was merely trying to help him obtain his son who had been kept from him. That's still kidnapping. That is still kidnapping. Yes, <laughs> it doesn't just, matter how you cut it. It's that's still right. kidnapping. Her story soon fell apart, and quickly the FBI and local police confronted her with the real facts that proved that she and Hall had, in fact, been together since his prison release. Hall and Hetty admitted to the kidnapping, but loudly denied having ever killed the child. Hall placed the blame on an ex-convict, Thomas John Marsh, a man he had known in prison. And, of course, this, too, is a fabrication, because, hello, we know more, right? Now we do, yeah. You see, Jen... Bobby had long ago met his terrible fate. The night before the kidnapping, Hall and Hetty took a shovel into Mrs. Hetty's backyard. They dug a small, shallow grave, one in which they intended to bury the body of the child they would kidnap the following day. After completing this ghoulish chore, the couple celebrated by getting uh, drunk. Seems like they got drunk a lot. (laughs) I wouldn't call that a celebration. I would just say they did what they normally do. Yeah. Yeah. The truth was that within the hour after kidnapping him, poor little Bobby Greenleaf had died. The gruesome twosome drove directly west to the state line road, crossing the Kansas Missouri state line with Greenleaf in the car, automatically inciting the Lindbergh statute that we talked about earlier. Right. Mm -hmm. Hall went south on highway 50 and west to the 69 highway he continued south through overland park kansas and deep into a wheat field with a tall um, a tall hedge around it near the intersection of highway 69 and 95th street he was looking for a suitable murder spot it's horrible but you would wouldn't you have had this planned out I mean, they're no, no, they're dumb. Yeah, they're not the brightest. So Hetty, who was well aware of what was about to happen, put a leash on her dog and exited the car and proceeded to take a dog for the walk. Now, we can only guess that this is because she knew what was going to happen and didn't really want to see it. So the murder was um, especially brutal. And actually, on a note here, I wasn't going to put this in here. And you told me to put it in here because of the it was so brutal that you thought it illustrated how evil the two were. So I did. So Hall, who was 171 pounds and five foot ten, tried to strangle the little first grader with a piece of clothesline. Now the clothesline was 15 inches, and it ended up being too short. Again, poor planning. Greenlees began kicking and fighting, so Hall hit him in the mouth and knocked out his teeth. Finally, the murderer pulled out his 38 revolver and fired at close range. Hall, this is heartbreaking. Hall nonchalantly went on to confess, quote. I missed him on the first shot, but the second one entered his head, causing him to bleed profusely and subsequently die. I do not remember exactly what position Bobby was in at the time of his death, but I believe I had pushed him down on the floorboard of the Plymouth, end quote. What a bastard. So Hetty returned after hearing the um, gunfire. Uh, She was kind of surprised by that because the original plan was that he would be strangled, so she didn't think there would be noise. So she was kind of shocked by that. But nonetheless, she helped clean up the mess. They lifted the plastic-wrapped dead body into the back of a station wagon and covered it with an old comforter on which, get this, the dog slept. She observed blood all over Hall's face and his slicked back hair and his shark skin suit. He rolled up his blood-stained sleeves and took off his jacket. She folded the jacket wrong side out and placed it next to the dead six-year-old. Finally, she took some Kleenex and wiped the blood off of Hall's face and the hands in preparation for their drive back to St. Joe, Missouri. The FBI agents went to Hetty's home, and there they found the tiny little body of Bobby Greenleys. It was found in Hetty's home, located at 1201 South 38th Street in St. Joseph, Missouri. The body had been wrapped in a plastic bag, and a large quantity of lime had been poured over this bag. The Greenleys family dentist identified the body as that of Bobby Greenlease at 1.05 p.m. Bloodstains were found on the basement floor and steps in the Hetty residence and on a nylon blouse and fiber rug. Some 38 caliber shell casings were also found in the house. These shell casings were examined by the FBI lab and it was found that they had been fired from a 38 caliber snub nose Smith & Wesson revolver that was in Hall's possession at the time of his arrest. The FBI lab also ascertained that a lead bullet recovered from the rubber floor mat in the Plymouth station wagon owned by Bonnie Hetty 
was also fired from Hall's 38 caliber revolver. Finally, Hall made a full confession for all his promises and assurances to the Greenlee's family. His sadistic cruelty was capped with a bland confession that Bobby Greenlee's was dead and that he had murdered the child only shortly after the abduction, having driven from Kansas City to a deserted farm. The court case of the United States versus Hall and Hetty took place at the U.S. courthouse in Kansas City, Missouri, and only lasted a mere three days, November 16th to November 19th. Can you believe that? It would have been a madhouse now, and the media would have been all over it. So the United States District Attorney representing the prosecution was Edward L. Schaeffler, a man who had prosecuted, I, I like this, had prosecuted 50% of the kidnappers sentenced to death under the Lindbergh Act of the federal court system. Wow, so do you know what that great. 50% was? It's half of something. Three out of six. Ooh, hey. So Hall's defense lawyers were court appointed while Hetty's lawyer had previously repped her in a few civil matters. The courtroom watched as Carl Austin Hall and Bonnie Hetty entered the Missouri courtroom in chains. While the defense attorney tried to sway the jury for life sentences, the prosecutor soon swept in using the best evidence that they had. Hetty and Hall's own verbal confessions. The courtroom was silent as Prosecutor Shuffler closing argument stated, quote, defense counsel said Hetty loved children, but she was more interested in her dog than Bobby. She had the option of telling Hall, no, Carl, let's not do this. Let's not plan the death of a child like this. She had a chance 50 times, 100 times, 1,000 times to stop this thing. She could have said no, but she did not. Little Bobby Greenlee's defenseless was trapped like an animal. It was one of the most heinous, brutal, and cold-blooded crimes in the annals of American history. If there was ever a case in which a jury was justified in taking a life, this is it. In essence, they showed no mercy, and they should get none. End quote. Bonnie, Katie, was uh, in an abusive relationship, so she probably just went with the flow with ever a man said but still come on looking for love and acceptance get over it on november 19th 1953 after hearing all the evidence a jury in the federal court in kansas city missouri recommended the death penalty after only get this an hour and eight minutes of deliberations that wouldn't even taken me that long 15 minutes after the verdict was announced judge reeves sentenced both of them to be executed on december 18th 1953 judge reeves said quote I think the verdict fits the evidence. It is the most cold-blooded, brutal murder I have ever tried." End quote. On December 18th, only 81 days after the crime, punishment for the heinous kidnapping and murder of an innocent six-year-old boy was about to be served. As the guards gathered, Hetty and Hall for their walk to the gas chamber. Christmas lights adorning their cells were extinguished by the guards. That kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. That's a little bit creepy. Right? Hall and Hetty were led out of their cells to the small, white rock building located outside the rec yard. Missouri authorities, in a somewhat macabre gesture, had a second chair installed in the chamber so that Hetty and Hall could be executed at the same time. Well, they wanted to get home for Christmas dinner. The devious duo held hands and kissed for the last time. They yeah. entered the gas chamber blindfolded and died after inhaling cyanide gas. A doctor pronounced Hetty dead at 12.58 a.m. Hall died two minutes later. All right, Jen, so I kind of thought this was fascinating. Bonnie, Hetty, and Carl Hall were actually the third and fourth people put to death under the amended Lindbergh Law. The Lindbergh Law is what we talked about earlier. Hetty was the only woman ever executed under the Lindbergh Law. In, in Missouri the, or anywhere? The second executed in Missouri's history oh, okay. up to that point. The last woman executed by the federal government in the 20th century. So she was the only woman ever executed under the Lindbergh law, the second executed in Missouri history, and the last executed by federal government. The immediately preceding um, federal executions were two figures that we might know about as well. Do you want to take a guess as to who they might be? Uh, give me a shot. Tell me. June 19, 1953, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Yes, Soviet spies. Yes, died in the electric chair, one after the other at Sing Sing Prison in New York. They were convicted of violating... Uh, Espionage the, Act. Yes, mm -hmm. the Espionage Act. The other one, Mary Surratt was put to death in 1865 for her role in Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Correct. So, Jen, one question remains. What's the question? 
Show me the money. <laughs> what happened to all that money? If you caught it earlier, I said that the police had found over 250000 in cash in the suitcase. But if you remember, the ransom was for 600000 Correct. And they only found one footlocker when they were supposed to have two footlockers. Two. The money was never found. Never. Never, never, never found. I'm not surprised by that at all. So the story goes somewhat like this. On the night of the arrest of Hall, Hager, the, the ex-con cab cabbie, rendezvoused with Costello, Shoulders, and his driver, who was Officer Dolan, near right. Hall's townhouse. They followed Hall back to his room, and Shoulders and Dolan barged in behind the cabbie, Hager, as Costello waited around the corner. Dolan and Shoulders arrested Hall, drove him to the district police station, booked him, placed him in a holding pen. The cops then disappeared for 80 minutes. When they returned, they carried in the footlocker and suitcase. It contained 288000 mm -hmm. More than half of the ransom money was missing, and Hall had spent no more than 5000 Nope, the cops took it. Yes. They were crooked. Crooked! So the missing money obviously didn't re reflect well on the St. Louis Police Department or on the FBI. It was said to really be a big embarrassment to the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. The FBI tried to track all the missing bills, but couldn't locate them. Only 115 of the bills turned up. Thousands more, no doubt, made it into circulation, but went when? undetected. A uh, side note. Hoover actually appointed an agent, Howard Kennedy, and he spent 15 years looking for that money. The recovered half of the ransom was returned to Robert Greenlee, so he got half of his money back. Well, it's a little bit less than half. Well, who cares? I mean, at that point, yeah. money doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're right. So what happened to the crooked cops and the mafia man? Cab driver Johnny Hager cooperated in the investigation and was not charged. He returned the remainder of it, the 2500 that Hall had given him. Joe Costello escaped indictment in the case. He invoked the Fifth Amendment against self-implication each time he was questioned about the missing money. I plead the Fifth. Both the police officers, Officer Shoulders and Dolan, were federally indicted for perjury in regards to the missing money. Uh, Shoulders was convicted on April 15th, 1954, and sentenced to three years in prison. And patrolman Dolan was convicted March 31st, 1954, and sentenced to two years. After they were released from prison, both returned to the St. Louis area. I bet they weren't cops anymore. I bet they weren't. So for years, Dolan was begged by the FBI to come clean. They even dangled um, a possibility of a presidential pardon. He repeatedly declined until 1962, when both Lou Shoulders and Joe Costello died. Finally, Dolan said he was ready to talk, and he confirmed suspicions, but also added a few details. Dolan said that Lieutenant Childers passed the money-laden luggage to Costello outside the hotel before they took Carl Hall in for booking. Costello took the money home. Shoulders and Dolan went back to Costello's place after booking Hall. Costello had removed half of the money from the luggage. Dolan said Shoulders offered him $50,000. Dolan apparently had told Shoulders, I don't want anything to do with that crap. Shoulders replied, you don't really have anything to say about it. It's, it's hush money. You know, as long as you can put other people guilty with you, right. then they're guilty. So Dolan said he lied to protect Shoulders and Costello because he feared for his life, which was... Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's no dummy. While he said he didn't take the cash offered to him, he did accept 1500 in hush money from Costello after he was released from prison. It was Christmas time, Dolan said, and he had a wife and six kids. As promised, and at J. Edgar Hoover's urging, President Lyndon Johnson pardoned Elmer Dolan in 1965. Hmm. So the FBI believes that Costello laundered the money through St. Louis mob boss John Vitale, who had connections with the Chicago mob. Oh, Chicago. I would have thought New York, but... Nope. Chicago. So Robert Cosgrove Greenlee Sr. lived for 16 years after the kidnapping. He died on September 17, 1969 at age 87. The mother, Virginia, died at age 91 on September 24, 2001, five days short of the 48th anniversary of the kidnapping. Wow, so sad. To include some thoughts, I think it's pretty amazing that two bar flies, two drug 
addled alcoholics got as far as they did with this. I don't I don't even know what to say right now because my mind's a total blank. And I think Bonnie Hetty, like you said earlier, I think she had really low self-esteem. I think she was broken down by her first husband. She did, and she wanted to be loved. And Hall, I think, just needed a woman to help work this out because you can't... No, Nobody's going to release a six-year-old kid to a man. And, I mean, it just... It was a different time, but it still wouldn't happen, you know? Right. So he needed a woman to help make this happen. How long were they dating before? Do you know? They knew each other and had talked. I think there was a, a prison inmate that was friends with each of them. Mm-hmm. And so they, when he immediately got out of jail, they hooked up. I mean, word was it was like he walked out of jail and into her. But then I read somewhere else that they met in a bar, so I'm not sure which one's true, but... That was pretty good. I, I, like I said, my grandma, it was something my grandma always spoke about. That had to be huge. Little I mean, Bobby Greenlees. So much has changed, and mm-hmm. we are so jaded by today's, what happens in the world and the news. But back then, it this, this was rare. It was extremely rare. So, thanks for listening. I hope you liked it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at ourtruecrimepodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us at Twitter, at sign ourtruecrimepod. Facebook. You can go to our website, www.ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Anyway, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Write us a review. Thanks.